This sermon was recorded at the Church of Christ Northwest Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 1708 Elm Springs Road in Springdale, Arkansas. Well, I was going over my notes this morning with a cup of coffee and I couldn't help but contemplate the difficulty that this person was called to do that we're going to be talking about today. He was told to take a wife that would not be faithful to him, to open himself up to someone completely that he knew would betray him and would break his heart. And I don't think any of us would be willing or have the ability to do that. But that is exactly what Hosea was called to do. And it is one of the most beautiful stories of God's grace. God chose Hosea not to go out into Israel just to spread and talk about the grace of God. He called him to demonstrate and to show the grace in a way that would apply to both Israel at that time and for us today as Christians. In Hosea chapter 1, Hosea chapter 1, starting in verse 1, he says, The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. I go back to verse 1 because it kind of provides us a context of what's going on in Israel at the time. Uh, they've been away from Egypt for a while now, and Israel has split into two. It is now Judah and Israel. And King Hezekiah is the one who is reigning at the moment. And if you look at 2 Kings chapter 18, that's 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 11, he says, And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria, and put them in Halah, in Habor, by the river of Gozen, in the city of the Medes, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed His covenant, and all that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded, it would not hear them, nor do them. They transgressed and went into the hands of the Assyrian Empire. This empire was probably one of the most vicious empires in all of history. They would go in and they would take over these kingdoms. Instead of establishing a, a new rule, they'd go ahead and let that king continue to rule that area. And they would answer to the king of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And if they messed up in any way, the Assyrian Empire would come in, they would kill all the men, torture the, the families, and they would make an example of the king. That is the rule that Israel, that Judah is under right now because they transgressed against God, because they left God, because they thought they could do things better. They thought that they wanted to go worship idols instead. They wanted to go live this life of sin because they thought it was fun. They thought it was interesting. And they messed up and they had to depart and they were departed from God. And we'll swing back and catch a little bit more of Hezekiah as we go. But in Hosea, back to Hosea chapter 1, uh, going into verse 3, he says, So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblam, which conceived and bare him a son. Gomer would have actually been a very beautiful woman. We're not talking about Gomer Pyle. <laughs> we're, we're talking about a very beautiful woman who would have, men would have tried to get her to leave Hosea. They were constantly bribing her. They were constantly giving her things to try and convince her to leave. And we also know that she would have been already living in a life of sin. She would have been living this life of whoredom, as it says. She would not be faithful. And Hosea would know from the get-go that the wife he chose was not going to be faithful to him. Now, while we won't read through all of Hosea and Gomer's children, though they all do have certain meaning to Israel. There's one in particular I want to catch in verse 9. Skipping down to verse 9. He said, Then said God, Call his name Loami, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. He is hurt 
God is hurt and betrayed by Israel. Just like Hosea is hurt and betrayed by Gomer. It notes that because they left God and transgressed against God, they are no longer His people. Like we mentioned about them talking about in Judah during the rule of King Hezekiah. But there is hope. If you go to verse 10, this is one of the reasons I love Hosea. There's hope all throughout this book. He says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured, nor numbered, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. As we continue through the story of Hosea, pay attention to this hope, this light, this grace, this mercy that you see here in this. As we go on, oh, wait, sorry, I messed up my notes. <laughs> uh, in Hosea uh, chapter 2, as we go on to Hosea chapter 2, starting in verse 1, we're getting into the betrayal that Gomer would commit on her husband. It says, Say ye unto your brethren, Emmy, and to your sisters, Ruhamah, plead with your mother. Plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and set her as the day that she was born and make her as a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms, for the mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers. They give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up the way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. She's seeing all these things in the world and she is so enticed by them. This is the same way that Israel has been enticed. They fall into the idol worship, into the sin, because what? They think it's fun. That it provides things better for them. That's what they're thinking. They're thinking that this is providing things differently than what God has provided for them. So it's the grass is greener mentality, that it's always better on the other side. And an idol does not have to be a false deity. Anything you give more care, anything you give more attention to other than God in your life can be an idol to you. The sin itself shows also how crushing this is to him. It shows this separation. When, when your spouse cheats on you and leaves you, it's not just like lying. It's not just like stealing. They stole something so much more from your heart. And it just hurts and it's crushing and it's painful. And here's the kicker. When you go into Hosea 2 verse 7, he says, And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. This is, oh, this is the same way that, wait, one second, my note's messed up. <laughs> And find them. Oh, shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now? She'll never be satisfied. The world will never satisfy you. You will never find enough if all you do is search after things of this world. You'll constantly be looking for, for better, for more and more and more. And that's the way the world works. That's the way it draws you in, the way it draws you in deeper. Going on to verse 8, For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof, and my wine in the season thereof, and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. So she thought the whole time the world was providing for her. No. No. Hosea was the one that was providing for her. Hosea was the one that had been giving her all these things the whole time. He gave her a vineyard. He gave her oil. He gave her flax. He gave her money. He doubled her money. 
He did all these things for her, but yet she still thought, nah, I can do better. I can get better out there. Everything that we have is because of God. Even if you decide to leave everything that you have is because of God. Everything that is provided to you is because of God. Yet people chase after the things of the world, and God created all things. God does not gloss over sin either. A lot of people skip over this part in in Hosea when talking about the story of Hosea. They skip over the part where he doesn't gloss over the sin. He says, going into verse 10, And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of mine hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she hath said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me. And I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them. And she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers, and she forgot me, saith the Lord. She left him, she went into this deep life of sin, and she forgot him. How hurt is that? If somebody that you loved and you cared about and you cherished left you into this other life, they just, they forgot about you. You love them, you care for them, you still love them, you still care for them, but they forgot about you. And he's saying, I will find her in her transgressions. He's going to find her in her sin in all of this. But going forward, God does gradually reveal his plan in this. In verse 14 to 16, he says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence in the valley of Achor for rewards that my lovers have given me. Wait. Valley of Achor. For, oh, oh, for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and she and shalt call me no more Bali. Because even in this, he still loved her. Even in all of this that she has done to him, he still cares for her. And there's also intimacy here that you kind of see in the names when you start to dig into what those names mean. Uh, Ishi, it says, uh, Thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Bali. Ishi means husband. Ishi is translated to husband, and Bali is master. So there's something more intimate in the relationship that God wants to have with His people and with us as well, not just one of a master to their people, but of a loving husband to a wife. Going on to verse 17, For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day... Will I make a covenant of them, the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven, with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword in the battle of the earth, and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, will I betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. He's saying he will take her as though she had never done anything wrong. In loving kindness, and in mercies, and even unto faithfulness. Even though she was not faithful. Even though she had done all these things, he will still take her and love her. And in Hosea 3, 1 through 2, you see, he wasn't able to just go get her. That's part of the painful part of Hosea, too. Is he wasn't able to just go get his wife and bring her back home. In Hosea 3, verses 1 through 2, he says, Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friends, 
yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord towards the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I brought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for a homer of barley and a half homer of barley. Hosea didn't just go get his wife back. He had to buy his wife back. But he takes her back into his embrace. And in verse 3, he says, I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. You will be mine, and I will be yours. And putting this in the context of the gospel, we are Gomer. We are Gomer. If you look into Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, God accepted us even though we were sinners. He accepted us into His embrace. In Ephesians 2, starting in verse 1, He says, And you hath He quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of powers of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God. Those two of the most beautiful words in the gospel. But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Even though He knew we were sinners, He knew we lived according to the desires of the flesh of the world, He still took us in His embrace, and He made us His own. He knew we were sinners, and He knew we were prone to sin, just like Hosea knew that Gomer was an adulterous woman and would fall into adultery, but He brought us into His fold anyways. And while our sins have already been paid for, to go and to choose that life of sin over God again causes, his, causes Him so much grief. It causes so much pain that He compares it to crucifying Christ over again. If you go into Hebrews chapter 6, it's Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. He says, For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and they put him to open shame. Seems so easy. It seems so easy to go back to it, back to that life of sin. But like Gomer was never satisfied, you will never be satisfied in the life of sin. There's also something to be said, again, about that specific sin that Gomer committed and the way that it separated her from her husband and the way that our sin separates us from God. We are called to humble ourselves, to be restored into Christ. Uh, if you'll go to James chapter 4, James chapter 4, verse 1, we're called to humble ourselves unto Christ as our God and as our Father. And he says, we're going to go all the way to verse 10. Uh, From whence come wars and fightings among you? 
Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss, and ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity, it's opposing with God. Whosoever therefore will be friend of the world is the enemy of God. If you're going to seek after things of the world over God and make the world your priority, you are now an enemy of God. You're making God your enemy by making the world your priority. You're separating yourself from Him and serving this bond this and severing this bond, this relationship that you have. Back into verse 5, he says, Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But He, again that, but God, giveth more grace. Wherefore, He saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. He wants us to completely leave that life of sin behind and come to Him, in humility towards Him, we will be lifted up. He wants a truly repentant heart. He doesn't just want, you know, that childish way that you walk up, oh, I'm sorry. No, He wants you to, to mourn over your sin and to, to hate that life. And if you've ever been there, where you've sat down and you realize where you've been, and the power of God, His grace and His mercy for Him to be able to forgive you. It does. It leads you to that, that, that mourning over those sins, that, that sadness in that, and then the joy in His grace and in His mercy. Hosea touches on this a little bit further during his, his discourse in the later chapters of Hosea which explains further to Israel the importance of his relationship with Gomer. Uh, the first few chapters of Hosea are the story, then the later chapters of the book itself is, is a, a discourse explaining everything and, and drawing everything out. <clears throat> in Hosea 6, 1, it says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will He revive us, and the third day He will raise us up, and we shall live in His sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, His, great, his, going, forth is preparing, uh, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. He is as sure as the morning and the rains, and if we follow Him, he will heal us in our relationship with Him, and He will revive us. And just like that, we do have a, a renewal in Christ as well. Back in Hosea 3.3, 3, uh, He had said, And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot. Thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. It sets this image of not just taking her back, into him, but renewing her and renewing the relationship that they had as though she had done nothing wrong. For anyone, this would be a very difficult thing to do, to take somebody back in that had done this to you and into your life and like nothing happened. But that's what he does. And in Romans, uh, Romans 12, if you want to go to Romans 12, starting in verse 1. 
He says, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. To be renewed, not conforming to the world. If you go into Ephesians uh, chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 22, kind of broadens out this picture a little bit for us. Uh, 4 verses 22 to 24. He says that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, leaving that old life behind, taking it away completely and becoming new, becoming fresh, something more beautiful made in the image of God. As we have mentioned many times before, this is not just a journey to be walked alone. We are human, and we have different struggles that we deal with, and it's so easy to turn back to a life of sin when you try to do everything on your own. And I'm not saying the journey will ever be easy, but God has given us the church family to help us on our way, brothers and sisters in Christ to, to support us, help guide us, and walk with us on our walk as Christians. If there's anyone who is struggling with whatever sin or worldly thing and needs help and support from the church, that's what the church is here for. You can feel free to come forward as we stand or come forward afterwards. But the church is here, it's loving, it's waiting, and it's so hard to do alone. Um, I had a buddy that was in, uh, I used to work with him years ago, and um, his name was Kyle. And he struggled with sin. Uh, he struggled with addiction. And instead of seeking the help that he should have sought after, um, he tried to white knuckle it. He tried to just kind of hang on and do it all on his own. Um, Kyle then died two weeks later. He went back to his life of sin. Um, he was a drug addict, and he was in Oklahoma, and he was in the middle of the street and got hit by a car. And that is not something I want for any of my brothers and sisters in Christ to fall into. And I don't care what sin it is. I don't care what, if you think it's not good enough to talk to somebody about, if you think it's too bad to talk to somebody about, it doesn't matter. You need to talk to somebody about it, and that's what the church is here for. You can come forward as we stand and sing. The song has been selected. We hope you enjoyed this teaching from God's Word. If there's anything we can do to help you in your walk with Christ, send us a message at facebook.com slash cfcnwa. To find more sermons, look for us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and like our Facebook page. Thanks for listening, and God bless.